And so it was a natural progression. Um, I gravitated towards it and have really made it a career from it. I'm currently the deputy over the sexual assault unit in the Fulton DA's office under DA Fonnie Willis. And prior to that, I was the deputy over the <laughs> domestic violence and sexual assault unit. I don't mean to make you laugh, but like, isn't that cool, y'all? Okay, but go ahead. <laughs> She's amazing. <laughs> and it's amazing working for, for her. Um, I used to work with her um, for years yeah. alongside of her. And to see her um, leading, it's been great um, to work under her leadership. And so I am the deputy of her sexual assault unit, which deals with adult sexual assault mm -hmm. and some domestic violence. The Stone Press Podcast. Spreading awareness within our community. Hey, neighbors. We're back again, ready to bring you a new episode of the Stone Press Podcast. And today we have an incredibly important topic that we're going to address. We have been trying to get this started for a while, so I'm going to say the devil's busy, so we're just going to dive on into this so we can get it done. We have an incredible guest that we really want to make sure that you guys are made aware of that you pay attention to, especially if you are a resident of DeKalb County. So I don't want to hold up any longer. I'm going to introduce to some and just present to others, Attorney Yolanda Mack. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I know we've had some trials, so I do apologize. I promise we're a real podcast. We do this fairly well most of the time. So before we dive into anything else, I want to really give you the opportunity to talk to us a little bit about why you became an attorney and also why you specialized in the field that you did as deputy district attorney for special, I want to say special victims unit so bad because I watched too much law and order, but for sexual assault and for domestic violence. What do we call it here in Georgia? Does it have a special term like that? No, I mean, my unit, um, the sexual assault unit is under the special victims division. Okay. Um, so special victims unit, special victims division. <laughs> oh, so, it's right. all, so you were correct. Oh, Detective Stabler taught me correct. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I feel, thank you, Olivia. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yes. Most people know SBU. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. I was like, well, maybe it's not that way everywhere. And that is like the television connotation of it all. But truly the special victims unit, that's really the umbrella. It is. Okay. It is. Awesome. Well, okay. Now that we put that to bed, one myth and one misconception cleared up. So talk to us a little bit about why you became an attorney and how you landed where you are. Oh, well, thank you again for having me. I'm so excited. Thank you. Um, I became an attorney. I always wanted to be an attorney, you know? Mm -hmm. And I started to specialize in special victims because I always wanted to help people. And so it was a natural progression for me. Mm -hmm. um, I started my career off as a public defender. And for those of you who don't know, you know, public defenders just that, you know, you assist people who have been charged with crimes who cannot afford to hire an attorney. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to give back, you know, to the community. And there's so many people, I say all the times, they're not the sum of their problems, mm -hmm. you know? Um, people fall on hard times. Um, they make bad decisions. And just having someone to um, help them walk, you know, through that. Yes. And um, after I became a public defender, that's when I started to... I um, work in the district attorney's office, and um, it's been amazing. Um, I started off by doing everything, right? So you don't get to start with SVU, right? Oh. <laughs> um, you have to start with possession of drug cases, you know, theft cases. And not that those aren't serious, but, you know, once you start to work with uh, victims of sexual assault and domestic violence, they want you to have had some experience um, with working with victims. And so it was a natural progression. Um, I gravitated towards it and have really made it a career from it. I'm currently the deputy over the sexual assault unit in the Fulton DA's office under DA Fonnie Willis. And prior to that, I was the deputy over the <laughs> domestic violence and sexual assault unit. I don't mean to make you laugh, but like, isn't that cool, y'all? Okay, yeah. but go ahead. <laughs> She's amazing. <laughs> yeah, and it's amazing working for, for her. Um, I used to work with her um, for years yeah. alongside of her and to see her um, leading, it's been great um, to work under her leadership. And so I am the deputy of her sexual assault unit, which deals with adult sexual assault mm -hmm. and some domestic violence. Awesome. It sounds, when you talk about it, I feel the passion, even though you're just being very fact-driven and you're giving us the information, but I can feel the passion behind your desire to do this work. What made you decide to, I guess, in switch teams, right? To move from being a public defender over to the prosecution side. You know, I found, and I did enjoy being a public defender, mm -hmm. But I did find that as a public defender, a lot of times my hands were tied, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can only do so much. Mm -hmm. And it's really the prosecutor who determines 
what charges to go forward with, what charges to reduce um, the sentencing. And so if I'm being honest, I thought as a prosecutor, I probably can do more good because you have more control, right? And so I used the time that I had as a public defender Mm -hmm. and what I learned dealing with people who were charged with crimes as a prosecutor, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I look at a case, I look at it from both sides. And so I can say, you know what? I think I'm going to reduce this. I think I can go to their lawyers and say, looks like your client really has a drug problem, so won't you find a facility for him? Mm -hmm. Because as the prosecutor, you have more of the control to decide what happens with the cases. I suddenly, you know, I liked you a lot already. I'm not going (laughs) to deny that. But that thought process, Mm -hmm. that is like an aha moment, I think, that, well, for me it was, and I can't put my ignorance or misunderstanding on anyone else, but I'm going to, right? I think that could represent an aha moment, moment for many people. Like, hey, the prosecutor is the one who's putting out the deals. The plea deals come from you. You have the opportunity to see the the sum of all parts, right? To understand if this person is really a hardened criminal and we need to get rid of them or this person needs help and support. There's some things your hands would obviously be tied on, but you can make it where maybe there's the opportunity for rehabilitation for them. Absolutely. And I tell people, I go to schools when I'm doing career days and People are like, oh, you're a prosecutor. I tell the kids, representation matters, mm-hmm. you know, on both sides. Absolutely. So I also still respect, you know, defense attorneys. They come and meet with me. They tell me about the clients, mm-hmm. you know, about their families. They bring me school records. Mm-hmm. And I think someone from the community who understands the community, I'm from DeKalb County, grew up here, um, Avondale Elementary School, Avondale High School. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm from the community. And I think it's important to have someone who's making the decisions. You know, because as prosecutors, people don't see it that way. You're making the decision. So someone who is still looking to be fair, Mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes fear is tough, right? Yes. You know, depending on the crime, fear is just tough. Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, this is too much. (laughs) Um, Too much has happened. (laughs) Right. And this is what has to happen. But we know that's not all the time. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. That's not every situation. And so it's good to have someone who looks at the cases in that way and is open to learning, opening, you know, I'm always open to listen. Yes. And I'm always honest, you know, even with the defense attorneys, even if they want something to happen, if it's a victim, I tell them I'm not going to do anything Mm -hmm. before I speak to him or her. Mm -hmm. That's the least I could do. Right. You know, even if I agree with you, you know, there's a way to do everything. Yes. And so I feel like I've been so successful. Mm -hmm. I'm really just, you know, having that type of view and that character and so many defense attorneys who even you know, support me even in my role now, you know, says, you know what, you know, because I've been on that side and I try to see things from both sides, it's been very helpful. You know what? I don't ever expect to beat my husband or anything like that, but I would be glad (laughs) to have you as the person prosecuting me fairly because you would know that if I hit him with that pan, (laughs) that it had, you know, I had snapped. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's important, even when I try cases, you know, one of the things that I tell jurors is that, you know, the person who's charged that chair um, doesn't have their name on it, mm. right? I'm like, anyone at even any given time can find themselves in that chair. We have yes. sons, we have, you know, husbands, we have um, fathers, and you would want someone who is prosecuting their cases if it, if you were in that unfortunate mm-hmm. situation yes. who's fair and who wants to look at everything and make a decision based on, on that. No, that makes total sense. And I feel like I could start digging into this topic <laughs> so deep. So this just lets me know that hopefully we'll have the time and you could come back again and we can kind of talk about it, especially in the Black community, and they're, oh, they keep putting our young Black men away. And and what does that look like? How does that happen? And why, you know, why it matters to us to be represented, right? And to understand the legal system better as a community as well. Absolutely. So we're going to go back to your specialization. Okay. Because as of now, we are in the crux of the holiday season. Everyone is shopping. Women are out late trying to get those presents for their kids, or people are just out there, or Things emotional, things happen. People are suffering loss or they're having memories. And just in 2023, for many folks, has been a tough year. It's been tough. And so you just never know what can make a person, I made a joke about snapping, but you really what can drive them over the edge during this time. And so I kind of wanted to transition the conversation into talking about people who are suffering from sexual assault and domestic violence during the holidays, especially if it's something that's kind of sprung up on them. They've been with their partner and they've never experienced this before. What are some things that we could talk to them about 
and um, resources that we could direct them to to support them in this time? Oh, resources. So the great thing about DeKalb, so of course, the first thing I always tell people, you know, if you find yourself in that situation, please call 911, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the domestic violence hotline. Um, but right here in DeKalb, um, there are three um, domestic violence shelters uh -huh. that services families in DeKalb County. And I don't think a lot of people know that. Um, the first one I would talk about is the International Women's House, um, which is a domestic violence shelter. I'm on the board uh -huh. um, for the International Women's House. It's an amazing facility. I mean, if you find yourself, you know, in a situation where you have to be, mm -hmm. you know, displaced, yes. you know, it's, it's, it's usually a very unpleasant time. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you um, the women there are amazing. Mm -hmm. They have rooms where the um, women, a lot of times it's women, men are victims of domestic violence mm -hmm. and they do service men. It's mm -hmm. just they can't stay at that facility. They okay. would get a hotel for them. Got you. Um, but for the women and their children, they would stay in a room together. It's mm -hmm. made like a hotel room. Uh -huh. you know, with their bathroom. Oh. I think a lot of times people think there's this big facility and everyone's mm -hmm. in the same room, you know, from watching TV and movies. Mm -hmm. um, they, um, the women just bond there. We have all kind of, um, we celebrate the holidays with them as board members. Mm -hmm. um, they come up with their grocery list every week, mm -hmm. um, you know, yes. of what they want to cook. It's not some prefix oh. um, meal. We work with the schools oh, nice. um, so that the kids can be in school, you know, and no one can look them up you know, and find out where they are. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, we also have the Women's Resource Center, um, which is a great shelter in DeKalb as well, and the Day League. Oh, that was a lot. We're going to make sure all of that is in the show notes, folks. <laughs> we want to make sure that you are aware of those resources. I kind of want to double back to one thing that you mentioned, and that is men are also victims of domestic violence. And I think we often think domestic violence, a husband and a wife or a couple, but there's more to it than that. Can we kind of talk about what domestic violence looks like? So domestic violence, um, as defined in Georgia, is really anyone who lives um, within the same home. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, it could be roommates. Mm -hmm. um, it can be a rooming house. Yeah. Um, but what we focus on a lot of times and what we talk about is intimate partner violence, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of the district attorney's offices, when they have a special victims unit, they want to focus on that intimate partner. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can have a, a mother and a child. So all of that is still under the umbrella of mm -hmm. domestic violence. But men are, you know, often I think sometimes we forget about, you know, sometimes the women are the aggressors. And sometimes you have same-sex situations. I think people, mm -hmm. uh, you know, forget about that community. Yes. And so that's why I was saying the International Women's House is amazing because we realize that and we serve as men as well. I, I think, thank you so much for expanding upon that because I think it's important that they're not forgotten, right? Even though the primary, like you said, is, I love the terms, I'm getting educated, intimate partner <laughs> issues, right? <laughs> so keeping that in mind. This is just a question, I think, from an education standpoint, okay. from a mother and a child or a father and a child, is spanking domestic violence? So yes and no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, corporal punishment is what we call it yes. know, in the legal community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, all of that depends on culture, Mm -hmm. um, background, you yes. know, what's excessive, <laughs> yes. what's considered not excessive. And those are sometimes the toughest cases. I can imagine. Um, because uh, to some people, um, leaving marks mm -hmm. um, is egregious to them, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And to others, not so much, mm -hmm. you know, right. is what they've grown up it's, with. It's a testament. You, see, look, remember, that's going to help you remember. <laughs> that's that you. And sometimes those are the, the, the tougher cases. Mm -hmm. And so I will say, you know, extreme. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, some cases, some people feel like if there are marks, you know, depending on the situation to mm -hmm. them, and it may depend who left the marks. Is it a right. daycare provider? You right. know, um, if it's within the home, you may have two parents who see it very differently. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you, um, for the most part, um, if it's excessive, if there are broken bones, mm -hmm. um, if there's tearing of the skin, um, if there are black eyes and a lot of bruising. I mean, sometimes, you know, many of us think, you know, by any culture now that is excessive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would agree. And so now you're you're within the... You know, the, oh, well, the okay. realm of, you know, domestic violence, you know. And so a lot of times you're trying to figure out, so what needs to happen, right? What's next? What's going on with the parents? Mm -hmm. You know, are they just abusive? 
Was it one time? Do they need counseling? Do they need jail time? And so you still start to run the gamut of what does this family Mm -hmm. need? Does this family want to stay together? Mm -hmm. Um, Do they want to separate? And so then you start those gymnastics of trying to figure out how do we get the best outcome for this case. And actually that explanation right there kind of helps people understand why it may take so long for resolution in these cases because there's so much to digest and determine what's the best course of action going forward. And, you know, in domestic violence cases, unlike stranger cases, see, stranger cases are somewhat easier. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone rallies behind the stranger, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know this person. This person did this to me. Mm -hmm. But intimate partner violence is so tricky, right? Mm -hmm. Um, They can take a long time because sometimes the victims, they go on a roller coaster of emotions, Mm -hmm. um, of what they want to see happen at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, The first time you meet them, they may say, this is what I want to see happen. I want him to go to jail. Mm -hmm. You know, it's excessive. It's gone on so long. Mm -hmm. Um, Three months from now, you may check in on them. They've been talking and, you know, (laughs) reconciling. (laughs) Reconciling. And they're like, well, I think he just, Mm -hmm. you know, needs, you know, some counseling. So sometimes, you know, you're just trying to figure out Mm -hmm. You know, just based on the crime, you know, what has happened, you know, following that victim. Sometimes victims know uh, what's best for them and their situation. We don't live with them. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not there day to day, you know. And so we we have to take a lot of time to listen to them to see what is it that you think you 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 need. need. That makes a lot of sense. And you're making that assessment. So let's just say we're a familial, a familial relationship. So I'm a sister, cousin close friend. Mm -hmm. And I believe that someone who's close to me is a victim of domestic violence. What are some of the appropriate steps that I should take to help support in that particular situation? So I wrote down five things um, that I thought was just really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. I love that she Mm -hmm. she came to give us the information, everybody. And so five ways, I feel like the best five ways, because there's so many things you can do. Um, The first thing is to believe them. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Um, So many times um, people suffer in silence because they don't think anyone anyone will even believe them, especially if they don't feel like um, you feel like you saw any signs or you're like, or you don't think that person would do that. That doesn't sound like Henry. Correct. Correct. So my first thing is to believe them. Um, The second thing, listen. You know, listen to them because a lot of times um, where it gets tricky, they're not ready to come forward. Yes. They're not ready to report. And Mm -hmm. I think that brings some frustration sometimes. People Mm -hmm. feel like, well, why don't they just leave? Yes. Um, And they're just not ready. So sometimes, you know, you just have to be in a position to listen, you know, to them, you know, offer practical help, Mm -hmm. Um, offer to help with the children, Mm -hmm. you know, offer to just kind of hang out with them and um, spend time. Yes. Um, I think every victim knows when they're ready mm-hmm. to make a decision because it will change their lives, yes. of course. And so we can offer some practical help. Be patient, <laughs> which is sometimes hard for people. Um, you know, because sometimes when we're not be. in a situation, we're like, I'm just saying she keeps telling me exactly. and I'm telling her she, if she would just do this and that. And that person has to decide for themselves, like many things. Yeah. You know, people have to decide for themselves when they're ready, you know, to come forward and then refer them to resources. Mm -hmm. Because even with some of these places, International Women's House, Women's Resource Center, Mm -hmm. you may not be ready to leave, but there's so many resources available to you Mm -hmm. right where you are. Okay, that's important to know as well. Like you don't have to displace yourself to get some support that might help you make the next best safe decision. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I enjoy that Mm -hmm. because if you're not ready, like how do you help them get ready? And another point that you made that I truly enjoyed, and that is spend time with them, right? Because I would imagine that being present would make someone think about like, oh, they're going to be able to see so-and-so really quickly. So actually... I want to circle that around. Like, how do you recognize signs of isolation to really determine that that person is being separated so that they can be abused or so that the abuser is hidden? Like, that it's their choice to be isolated or that they're being forced into isolation? I might not be asking this appropriately, but somewhere in that realm. Um, Yep, I thought about that. Um, (laughs) um, You know, some of the things, you know, you talked about isolation. 
um, and a disinterest in things that they're usually very interested in. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. um, something that they usually would jump at the opportunity to do. You find them not wanting to mm -hmm. do any of those things. Um, that's usually a sign. Um, covering up. Oh. Covering up. Mm -hmm. um, long sleeves. High long necks. sleeves. Um, high necks. Um, um, you know, isolation from family and friends at things they normally would come to. Um, things they would normally participate in. Um Ultra private. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, people who become very ultra private, mm -hmm. um, annoyed by the fact that, you know, you're kind of showing up, even though we can do, we can be annoyed <laughs> by people showing up, but maybe in the past they weren't, you know, right. the fact that you keep calling, mm -hmm. um, the fact that you're asking a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, those are some of the things. You that, can look for. That makes a lot of sense. Definitely the questions, right? Like, yes. They're like, why do you need to know all of that? Like, Correct. Why? Like, Correct. why are you worried about what I'm wearing? I don't care it's 90 degrees and I'm in a turtleneck. I think it's fashionable. Right. And <laughs> stop know? asking me questions about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of those. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, girl, you're wearing a lot of makeup. You never used to wear makeup before. Well, I'm trying something new. <laughs> you know? Right, right. And I mean, so many times, you know, people think that it's just physical, right? Mm -hmm. Those are kind of the, the easier Yes. You know, things to spot, you know, is, is psychological, mm -hmm. um, is financial, mm -hmm. um, is emotional, is so many, is sexual abuse. So it's so, so many more things that sometimes people are suffering. Right. And they're hidden. Right? And they're hidden that you, yeah. you can't see. Okay, that got deep. <laughs> but you gave some really great advice and some things that you can use as a tool as a friend. And then we also have the resources, which will be in the show notes. If we were going to transition the conversation a little bit more, because we did talk about sexual abuse, but that was between intimate partners. But for sexual assault as a whole, that happens more during the holidays. And I'm kind of wondering what that looks like and how you can protect yourself from being put in the situation of being a victim, if that is possible. You know, um, with the sexual assault, I think a lot of times education on both sides mm -hmm. is everything. Mm -hmm. um, I deal with so many, some of my toughest cases, and it's not even during the holidays, are the college age young adult mm -hmm. cases. Okay. Different, different interpretations of what's happening. Mm -hmm. I think most of the time people think, you know, sexual assault, mm -hmm. you know. Um, violence. The, the violence, yeah. snatching the person off the street, yeah. you know, hands down. There's mm -hmm. no question that the person did not know you. Right, right. They did not consent to that. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, and those are the, what I call the easier cases mm -hmm. um, to prosecute, right? Right. But then there are the cases where you have the two college students, mm -hmm. uh, the confusion, even sometimes on the young male's part. Right. You know, mm -hmm. on what's happening because, of course, they're young. Yes. You know, they're um, excited to be in the situation. Right. Um, right. You know, their brains aren't fully really developed either. You right. know, but then you also have a young girl who's like, this is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Those are the toughest ones. And so, what I have found, I mean, I don't want to say not putting yourself, like, there are certain things that we learn that I would just say, don't even do it. Mm -hmm. So, like, college students, you know, at the end of the evening, if she's really drunk and the, the friends are hanging out mm -hmm. and the boys are really nice, right, and say, hey, I'm going to walk her back to her, just don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just don't. Don't walk her Let back. her friends, you know, don't walk, her, walk back. her back. And, you know, I know it's been a gentleman, right? right? That's what we learn. You know, hey. Yeah. But so much, us trying to unravel <laughs> what then took place, mm -hmm. you know, um, get so hard and so complicated. So although there are things that used to be chivalrous, you know, we would just advise, just let her girlfriends, you know, handle Wonder. that. And then that way we won't have to try to figure out, well, what happened when they arrived to the dorm room? Right. You know? Right, exactly. Um, was she, did she welcome him in? Did she say, I'm sober now? Did he right. give her water along the way? And she really is sober now? All of those things. What about a group, for instance? Like, he, she does, she's not with girlfriends. She is actually kind of alone. If they walk as a community, is that better? Or that could still scramble it even more? Well, a, a community helps, mm -hmm. right? A mm -hmm. community helps. Unfortunately, you know, if it's one girl in a community of boys, that can just be bad too, unfortunately. Absolutely. I can see that. Um, you know, um, but it helps. Mm -hmm. 
it helps. So I think education, you mm-hmm. know, to young people, what's right. good, what's bad, what's too much drinking, you know, because mm-hmm. sometimes you can't tell people not to do things because they're going to do certain things, mm-hmm. but just to not find themselves, in that. you know, in situations that mm-hmm. we may unravel, but, you know, sometimes some of the damage just too much damage has been done Mm -hmm. by the time it gets unraveled. That makes a lot of sense. And you're talking about education. One thing I would hope maybe we can educate today is what are signs of no that are ambiguous that we should still honor? I tell all the boys, no, a a slow no, Mm -hmm. a faint no. I think I might just take it all as a no. Mm-hmm. Now, I know sometimes that does not seem practical, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we're thinking, you know, philosophical, mm-hmm. but it would save you a lot of headache mm-hmm. and a lot of time later. Yes. You know, and I know it sounds, you know, cliche to say no means no. Mm-hmm. It really does. You know, um, I think one thing people didn't realize, you know, consent um, can be rescinded. Mm. Right. Let's say that again. <laughs> you know, consent can be rescinded. Yeah. Um, some people they find themselves, and I, I listen to the stories from the beginning to the end, and she's saying yes, you know, up into a point. Mm-hmm. Um, and she will say sometimes, oh no, I agreed to that, right? Mm-hmm. I, I was okay with the kissing. Yes, I was okay with that part. Mm-hmm. But then mm-hmm. it, it changed. I didn't want to go yeah. any further than that. Mm-hmm. And okay, so that no is is, is a no. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing people don't realize, um, consent to one thing is not consent to all things. Yes. That has become a complication Yes, because sometimes someone said, well, yeah, I was okay with the vaginal. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when he wanted to do the anal, I, I, that's when I said no. Mm-hmm. So let's keep that's that in a mind. no, you yeah. know? So, right. um, so I think, you know, the education, so instead of just saying no means no, you know, getting into the some of the weeds mm-hmm. and what I consider scenarios and situations that mm-hmm. I've seen where I'm like, that's a no. Right. <laughs> and I think I don't want to do this anymore. That's it's a, a no. That's a no. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, it, if you have to question it, just take it as a no. That's the best part. That is that's the, the word easiest for the way to do <laughs> right. it. Yeah. Um, that is just the easiest way, mm-hmm. way to do it. No, I appreciate that because that makes a lot of mm-hmm. sense for... Number one, if you have to ask yourself, and I had a long-term career in human resources, and I used to say, if you ever have to ask yourself, would I get disciplined for this? Then that's probably something you should not do because nine times out of 10, don't put yourself in the position of a guessing game to give your supervisor or anyone else the opportunity to believe that you were doing something outside of the scope of ethics for your role. But absolutely, I know this is not work, but but the same idea. or It's the same idea. Right. You know, and, you know, as I was telling you before, I have a son and a daughter, Mm -hmm. you know, so I see these cases, you know, from both sides, Mm -hmm. you know, you know, those of us who work in these cases are like, I think my son should get a waiver. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, just because it's it's so it it seems so easy from the outside. But Mm -hmm. when you're really trying to be fair and when you're really trying Mm -hmm. to dig, you're really trying to figure out what is happening what is going through the minds, what was conveyed. Yes. Um, that's important that we tell young girls what, or and women what was conveyed mm-hmm. to him. Mm-hmm. So we see the cases where she says, I didn't want to. Mm-hmm. He knew I didn't want to. How did he know? How did he know? Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't... I didn't say anything, but he could tell, like, from my behavior. Mm-hmm. And so now we're in the weeds. I'm like, mm-hmm. okay. Did, did you kick him? <laughs> right. Did you, know? you kick him? Did you yeah. pull away? Mm-hmm. Did he use any type of restraint or intimidation? Yeah. Right. No. But he knew we had talked before. He knew this wasn't something I'm like, mm-hmm. but at the time, because, and, and it's uncomfortable conversations because mm-hmm. what is conveyed to him? Mm-hmm. Because, of course, what he's saying is if yeah. she had indicated at all right. that she didn't want to do right. it, you know, because her no was kind of, you know, no, you know, right. and she was smiling, so I didn't know. And then, but the, sometimes mm-hmm. the crazy thing is, they don't even say no at all. They just say, it, they just said they just felt like the person should have known from their behavior. Right. I was giving off this aura, and if I he was, was correct, mm-hmm. um, and so we have to teach women and girls, you have to use your words, mm-hmm. you know, in some way to. Right convey to them, right. this is not okay. Clearly communicate as best as possible. I know sometimes you're in those situations and you kind of feel like afraid, like, oh man, I've gotten this far. Like, 
do I owe him now? Yes. You know, and all, and that's a real tough position to be in. But I think what we're trying to say today is you never owe anyone anything at any no. time. My favorite, well, I have, I've said I've had a fav- a couple of favorites from <laughs> Attorney Mac today, but consent can be rescinded. You're never obligated, no matter how far down the road you've traveled, you can change your mind. And it's the other person's responsibility to respect that. You Absolutely. Have changed your mind. And empowering our girls and our women to be okay with using your voice, Mm -hmm. saying, I'm not okay with this. Yes. Well, I know I I, I said I would when I got here, but I haven't since changed my mind. (laughs) Um, And that's okay. And And sometimes they do feel like Mm -hmm. that's why a lot of people don't come forward. Mm -hmm. Because I said, okay, like uh, um, one that's really popular right now um, with the young lady, Cassie and Puff Daddy, right? right? Very public. She stayed for 11 years. You know, at first, I'm sure she was down with it. Then she changed her mind. Like, but hey, there's a time where you could even awaken. You never know what happened spiritually, what happened physically, or that right. made that person say, you know what? I'm crazy to stay in this. Or, right. or what bound them there? What insecurities they have not overcome? Or what type of upbringing they had that made them feel that this is their only opportunity for survival? There's so much to and never keep in feel, mind. And never feel bad you know, or guilty about it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we have just as many cases, what we call delayed disclosure, Mm -hmm. which are people who don't come forward right away. Yes. um, As we do with people who come forward right away. Mm -hmm. It's just as many. And so many of them um, feel bad about something that they were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that self guilt. You know, if I had not have been drinking so much. Yes. If I had, if I had have left when, you know, mm-hmm. when I said I was going to leave. Right. And so it takes him a while. Right, to come you know, to I come was forward. flirting. You know, I did let him touch me intimately, you know. Right. And, and or a friend, you know, and right. whatever the case may be. Oh, guys, right. there's, we are in the weeds, guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, but this is important conversation is. that we don't have, especially amongst the, our young people. And I think educating our boys, right, on how it's about respecting themselves, too. Absolutely. Right? I think a lot of times it's a misconception that it's a a powerful thing for them and a demeaning thing for women. But really, our bodies are our temples for males and females. And we both need to respect our bodies by honoring the person that we are sharing them with. If they say no, honor yourself by, you know, listening. And women too. Absolutely. (laughs) Women too, because men say no. And just because you're a woman doesn't give you the right to not listen to him as well. Absolutely. Not that I'm an expert. I'm just saying... (laughs) I got a son too. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Right. So we talked about best practices, some recommendations. Um, let's have some time. We may have kind of intertwined this, mm-hmm. but are there some myths and misconceptions you would like to point out that we could talk about in the areas of domestic violence and sexual assault that we would kind of want to keep in mind, like some truths that, or excuse me, some falsities that we believe are truth or vice versa? Um, I think one of the main ones, especially that we're seeing now playing out in the media, um, a co- there are two. One, um, especially in domestic violence situations, people feel like, well, why don't she just leave mm-hmm. if it was that bad? Mm-hmm. If that person was doing all those things, mm-hmm. surely she would mm-hmm. have left. And so we know, you know, from the research with victims victims of domestic violence, there's so many reasons Mm -hmm. why people don't leave. Uh, We know that it's the the most dangerous time for a victim is the day that she decides to leave. It's the most dangerous time Mm -hmm. because the abuser wants to abuse, Mm -hmm. right? The power and the control. And so the day that she decides to leave, so sometimes they're scared because they know. Mm -hmm. If he catches me doing this, this could be the end. And I right. believe there is a statistic that I will try to find. And if you know, you are free mm-hmm. to share that so many women die or people who leave, they they actually, when they're caught, there's a certain percentage of them, if they're caught, that they actually die that day. Right. It's the most dangerous time. Mm-hmm. So people don't leave even societal pressures, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if they have children, some people think it's better. Mm-hmm to be with the father of their children Mm -hmm. than to be alone. Absolutely. I don't want to be a statistic. I don't want to be a single mother where my son needs his father 
And, you know, as long as I can try to shield them from this violence that yes. I'm experiencing, as long as he doesn't see his dad do that, right. it's better that he's present. Um, you know, depending on religious backgrounds. Big one. Right? It's frowned Big upon one. sometimes, depending on the religious background, mm -hmm. to um, be a single parent. Mm -hmm. um, finances, depending on that dynamics, mm -hmm. where will I go? Mm -hmm. yes. Where will we live? Let's see. You know, what will we do? He right. makes the money. Mm -hmm. The car is in his name. So right. we, you know, all of those things. Right. And so I think that is definitely a misconception. Mm -hmm. And then I think with sexual assault, um, what we're learning now, because it's more in the media, um, well, if that happened, mm -hmm. why would the person wait so long to come to forward. say anything? Because, mm -hmm. you know, we all think because if it was me. Yeah, right. <laughs> Until it is you. <laughs> Until it is you. And <laughs> when I'm trying cases, I tell jurors all the time, we all think that we know what we would do in a situation, but have you ever been in a situation Certainly. and you said, oh, I thought if I saw a crime, what I would do is, mm -hmm. and then you freeze or do something that you didn't even realize you would do. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, with sexual assault is that way. People mm -hmm. think, oh, I heard that if she, if he had did all of those things, mm -hmm. why would you wait a year? Why would you wait six months? Why would you wait two or three weeks? Absolutely. Um, but of course, we know there are so many reasons. Other reasons. Other you know, why... Um, you know, women a lot of times are victims, just don't, mm -hmm. you know, come forward. A lot of times they're embarrassed mm -hmm. that they let it get that far. Right. Mm -hmm. They feel some self-guilt. Mm -hmm. uh, will anyone even believe me? Yeah. Right. Especially if they painted a picture of perfection towards their family. And, and, and now they're like, OK, I was lying. OK, were you lying then or are you lying now? Right. right. Um, even going through the legal process. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. People think, do I want to do all of that? You know, because yeah. it is a process that comes with it. Mm -hmm. You know, we have victim advocates. We try to walk them through it, hold their hands and make sure they have what they need. Mm -hmm. But it's still a process. Do I want to take the stand and tell all these strangers? Yes. You know, something that although it's not my fault, yeah. that I'm still embarrassed to, <laughs> it was still, I, to repeat. I, I feel like I'm an active participant, even though I am the victim. Correct. Right? And my journey as a victim shouldn't be, I'm hostage to that. In Correct. Essence. Correct. So, you know, so those of us who work in the field, we know we have just as many people mm -hmm. who crowd right away mm -hmm. <laughs> as we do who, people who who waited. Absolutely. I this I watch a lot of movies and I think about this particular scene. It's almost everyone's favorite scene of this movie. And it is a, what's love got to do with it. And they are in the restaurant and Ike is, you know, shoving cake in Tina's mm -hmm. face, you know, eat the cake anime. Mm -hmm. And her friend, Jackie, who was also a background singer, comes in there and Ike hits her. And she turns around and says to Ike, you don't have to hit me, but once, but once. And everyone is like, that would be me. Correct. But she was not his wife. Right. She had other means to go and be employed. She had not been groomed from a young person. There's so many things to consider why she said, you don't have to hit me, but once, but why Tina sat back down and started to try to consume the right. cake. Right. And I think it's... It's hard because if you ever talk to, they love that person. Mm -hmm. They're not bad to them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I heard one survivor telling her story where her um, estranged husband um, shot her and paralyzed her. Oh. And she's talked about still thinking about the good times mm -hmm. that they had. Yes. And when they went to Disney and all those things. Now, of course, we're all thinking, you know, if you're not doing this type of work, like, yeah. oh, well, that would trump yeah. all of that Absolutely. shooting me and paralyzing right. me. But but you're missing Disneyland. Right. That you're sounds missing crazy. missing right. the good days. That's where that mm -hmm. power, that cycle of violence that mm -hmm. people, you know, talk about. You know, it's not bad all the time. Right. You know, it's just sometimes, you know, I just do things to trigger him. And, yeah. I, and if I would just, you know remember that he doesn't like his steak that well done. You know, and you know. he's stressed, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a lot it's, going on, it's, you know. Money is tight, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, and so it's all those things because when you have the good days, a lot of times everyone just really wants their family to work, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. At the end of the day. Yes. You know, so if you can hold on to some, you know, hope in those good days and those good times and mm -hmm. when he's in what we call the honeymoon phase, yes. right? Yes. When he's saying, you know what, you know, I'm sorry. I'll never do it again. Right. And when he's buying the gifts and he's saying, you know, I just, I need to get help. And of course she wants to support that, mm -hmm. you know, 
but we know it's a cycle, right? right? Because it always goes back around. Mm -hmm. But that's the phase that she really would like to stay in. Right, absolutely. And he probably does too. Right. He probably does too. Like, yes, he's a, in essence, he's a monster, but does any human, I'm a woman of faith, y'all already know that, mm -hmm. but does any human on this earth that God gave life want to stay being evil? I don't think so, but I think that there's something about them not escaping it and then something about them believing like, hey, I'm, I can't, I've already done enough, so I'm just going to keep on down this path. It's almost like I have to keep doing wrong for, you know, them to notice me or, and then some people are sick and they really need help. And that's really difficult to do to admit that. I mean, that's true. I mean, you know, the, you know, abusers, you know, they have to take some self-accountability. Mm -hmm. What do you need? Yeah. You know, what do you need to help you be better? I need her to listen. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, um, and that person has to get to a place where they're willing to seek out, you know, whether it's addiction, whether it's just not knowing how to communicate, not knowing how to deal with, mm -hmm. you know, stressful situations, whether it's psychological, but whatever it is, it's incumbent upon them. Mm -hmm. Right, to take account. You know, to take accountability and to seek out right. um, that help. Same thing that you said about the victim. She needs to be ready to leave or he needs to be ready to leave. The abuser needs to be ready to stop abusing. They need to be ready to do the work on themselves to be the better human that Absolutely. they're supposed to be. Absolutely. I could talk about this for a while, not because I enjoy talking about such deep, dark things, but I just feel, again, that we don't talk about it enough. And that's another reason that it's continuously happening, right? Because we aren't educating ourselves. We're not open enough to listening to the tough conversations that other people are going through. We want to ignore it. Right? Oh, thank God that's not happening to me. Right. Or thank God that's not my sister. Oh, really? Tony's cousin? Oh, man, that's terrible. Why, why aren't we trying to make sure that we're raising our sons to be the men that they should be and talking about these things early enough. And the same thing with our girls. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Is there anything else that you would like to share on this topic before we transition to something that's much brighter? Okay. Well, one thing I would like to say, I tell um, people all the time, I like to leave them with something. You know, if someone finds themselves in that situation, yes. right? Um, or someone who's listening, or if you know someone in that situ situation and they're not ready, mm -hmm. there are some things that can assist with the prosecution of your case, right? Okay. Because sometimes when you delay, sometimes people say, well, if I come forward, who's going to believe me now? Mm -hmm. That was uh, six months ago. Right. Um, that was a year ago. So I tell people there are things that you can do. Um, take pictures, mm -hmm. you know, kind of along the way. Yeah. Um, journaling. Okay. Um, confiding in someone. Even I'm um, going to get medical attention. I mean, because if you're not ready to report, but those are things that when you're ready, mm -hmm. because you do have evidence-based prosecution, right? Mm -hmm. The person, you know, who's charged does have a right to look and say, well, well, just because she said that. Yes. You know, so, you know, sometimes we need things mm -hmm. like, you know, to kind of show these things were happening along the way. Right. So if it's possible, try to keep some things. And then that way, when you're ready, mm -hmm. You know, it'll be, you know, I continue to take pictures. Um, yes. I confided in this person, my sister, uh, my mom. You know, I went to the hospital, although I didn't tell them what it was about. We right. can still get those records. If you're seeking counseling, if you mm -hmm. consent, we'll get those records. Mm -hmm. Because who goes to counseling and, and just makes up a whole situation, right? right? You, know, you know, you're like, I'm, you know. And that's, that's a crazy person. Right, sure. and so we can bring, and so those are things I tell people in the meantime. Mm -hmm. That would be helpful that when we get mm -hmm. the case to be able to move forward with it. And those are practical things that you can do, right? You have to go to the doctor. And actually, look back to special victims, even, that makes a lot of sense. Well, like, hey, go in there and fix yourself up. No, we're not going to the doctor. Right. Because that can be documented and used later on down the it line. It can. Hopefully. Hopefully this helps someone, whether you are in a situation that you need support with exiting or you know someone in your family, hopefully some of the information that we shared today will bless you. Thank you again so much for sharing all of that information with us. I know that many people will find it valuable. But now we're going to transition into a topic that is a little bit brighter. We don't anticipate calling you attorney Yolanda Mack for too much longer because you have extended your candidacy for judge in the county we live in, DeKalb County, and I loved your slogan, 
for the cab, from the cab, or from the cab for the cab. <laughs> it's all about the cab. It's all about the cab. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about your campaign for judge. Oh, thank you so much. So I am a candidate for the cab state court judge. Mm-hmm. Um, it is an open seat. Judge Purdom, who's been on the bench for years, I think over 30 years, is retiring. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm from DeKalb County. I attended Avondale Elementary School, Avondale High School. I'm a double HBCU graduate. I graduated from Alcorn State University undergrad and Texas Southern Thurgood Marshall School of Law. And after graduation, I came back here to practice law. Um, I started my career as a public defender. And so I am truly a public servant. Um, As a prosecutor, I do domestic violence and sexual assault cases. I am a two-time attorney of the year. And while I was supervising domestic violence and sexual assault, it was, I have, I was the unit of the year. And so it's just been, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Tell the people again, what, where, when you were supervising, what happened? Yes, I, I was two-time attorney of the year when I was doing crimes against women and children. And when I was doing um, homicide cases and while supervising domestic violence and sexual assault, my unit was attorney of the year. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> now continue. Um, so I'm, tr- I'm truly a public servant. And I have launched my candidacy for DeKalb County State Court Judge in the county I love, raised in. It's been amazing. Um, As I talked about in the podcast, I'm on the board for the International Women's House here in DeKalb County, a domestic violence shelter. Mm -hmm. I am a part of the Leadership DeKalb Class of 2021, as we say, the best class (laughs) ever. Um, I'm a part of the National Council of Negro Women. I work with their uh, the Black Pearls. I'm the co-chair. Okay. Which is the mentee program for the for the young girls. Awesome. Um, and so we work with Sheriff Maddox's summer camp, her Girls to Pearls summer camp. Lovely. Um, I'm I'm a part of Junior League DeKalb, so I'm all in with DeKalb um, in the community, which I think is important as a judge. Absolutely. Um, to not only be fair and to see both sides. I've been on both sides but also someone who's a part of this community, from this community, and understands the community. Um, I am excited about state court, um, because if you don't know what state court, um, they are more of the lower level criminal cases. Mm -hmm. And so you can do a lot of good there. Um, I know they have a lot of the diversion programs there. And one thing they don't have is the domestic violence um, diversion. And that's something I want to start, you know, where you can offer resources to someone who may be um, has a lower level domestic violence, maybe the first time, mm-hmm. you know, so what are the resources and things we can put in place to maybe help that person, you yes. know, or help this family stay together? There's one thing that I, you mentioned, I believe, in our pre-call that you didn't mention today about DeKalb County. And didn't you serve as um, district attorney for DeKalb County too? Yes, I was the deputy okay. over the domestic violence and sexual assault unit in DeKalb County. In DeKalb County. When, when my unit received attorney of the, a unit of the year. <laughs> See, that's where it was. <laughs> Bro, all of you guys are looking like, oh, that happened in Fulton. No, it didn't. Yep, that was right here in DeKalb. <laughs> right here. Um, and it made an amazing experience. Um, I learned so much about, you know, the domestic violence and sexual assault and the resources here in DeKalb. And that's when I um, um, joined the board. Yes. Um, of the International Women's House once I learned so much about the good work that they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been on there for several years and we just do such good work for families here in DeKalb. Awesome. That is beautiful. If you want to learn more about attorney, soon to be judge, mm-hmm. if y'all get out here and learn about her, I'm sure you'll like her. So attorney Mac, can you tell us where we could find you on social media, your website and all of that stuff? Absolutely. So I'm on all the major platforms. Um, you can um, find my website on yolandaforjudge.com. I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn under yolandaforjudge.com. Winning. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for Thank your you. time. Thank you for your education. Thank you for your service. We really appreciate what you've done and for joining us at the Stonecrest Podcast. We're always trying to make sure we're spreading awareness and bringing people the information that they need. So we hope to have you back to have some other conversations, because I'm sure people will be in the DM about why didn't you ask this? Or I wish we you would have said such and such. So if you have the time, I know you're about to be busy and maybe even closer to election day, we could have you back to talk a little bit more about it. And thank you for your time today. Thank you. Absolutely. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And so that would be a wonderful time to come back and bring awareness to that topic. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Looking forward to it. And Thank you again. We're going to get you out of here on this rainy day so that you could get, well, I'm hungry, so I'm putting that on YouTube. Maybe get a little snack and have a lovely evening. And neighbors, we'll catch you next.